Amen. So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And, you know, it's a longer chapter. And, uh, but you have to remember in this book, you know, this is basically this entire book is Moses just giving his parting words before he dies, before he passes away and Joshua takes over and leads them in the promised land. So, of course, you know, he's taking a lot of time to really lay things out. And chapter 28 is, is really, you know, kind of a crescendo. I mean, we've been reading through Deuteronomy, going through it uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter for several weeks now. And we see a lot of, you know, warnings in the Word of God. He alludes to a lot of these curses that God will bring upon them and warns them and over and over. But chapter 28, I mean, he just really lays it on thick and just reminds them of all these terrible things that are going to come upon them. And it starts there in verse 1, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt dil hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So, of course, he starts out the chapter reminding them of all the good things that God wants to do for them. You know, it's not just that God is sitting there just waiting for a chance to hammer these people or, you know, to come down hard on them, but he, God knows what is in man, and he knows the na man's nature, so he does issue this very stern warning that if they do go astray, that God is going to chasten them severely. And I mean, we re just read through it there. I mean, that chastening is no joke. I mean, that is some serious uh, judgment that God is bringing down upon them where they're going to be groping in the noonday. You know, they're going to be blind, wandering about. And even after God has taken away all these things from them and given them physical diseases and sores, then he's even going to remove them to a far distant land where they're going to be a stranger. They're going to worship false gods and they're just going to be nothing but afraid. I mean, this is such a a strong warning in the Word of God. And the irony is, of course, that is exactly what happens. These, these exact things fall out under these people. In a few generations, we know that they're, they are worshiping other gods. They're not following after His commandments. And, you know, and it just goes to show you that God's not bluffing. That when God says, hey, this is what I'll do, you know, if you get out of sorts, you know, that He went ahead and did that. You know, he, he sent the, uh, the Assyrians, you know, He sent the Babylonians, and He, and he, and he besieged their cities, and He took them captive. These things happened. So God's not, you know, just bluffing up in heaven when he lays these things out. He's not just trying to wax eloquent here or, or sound, you know, he's, this isn't just a blustery speech by Moses. This is what God does when he chastens his people. So, but of course it starts out on a more positive note, right? And I don't want, again, I don't want people to get the idea that that's all God is about, you know, that he just wants to, you know, come down and drop the hammer on people because it starts out there and saying, If thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to, and to keep his commandments. Then verse 2, Then all these blessings shall come on thee. So God's starting out saying, Look, there's, there's, you can be on one of two sides with me. You know, you can get at my good side or you can get my bad side. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that being on God's good side, you know, that's what's beneficial for, for us as individuals and as entire nations. I mean, God is speaking to the nation of Israel here. And of course, we know that God can judge a nation. The Bible says that all nations shall be turned into hell that forget God. But nations, we have to remember, are also composed of individuals. We can apply this as well to our own personal lives. You know, if it, maybe God's not going to smite us with the, the burning and the itch and all these things. He might too, but, you know, God will chasten us in other ways as well. You know, we, we want to make sure as Christians that we're coming down on God's good side. You know, and I talked about this a little bit on my Sunday, on my Sunday afternoon service where I was talking about how, uh, you know, some people have this mistaken notion, this very popular uh, uh, notion that's out there in Christianity today, that God, that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, you know. But that verse go on and says, it says, as I mentioned in that sermon, to them that walk not after the flesh. You know, if we walk in the flesh and do those things that are contrary to the word of God, you know, God is going to chasten us. Uh, that's just the way it is. But that's not what God wants. You know, we have, so we have to decide in our life, what side of God do we want to come down on? And if you would, keep something there in Deuteronomy 28 and go over to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. <clears throat> so we could apply this to individuals and even as, entire, as whole nations. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 133, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. So the, the nation that chooses the Lord, you know, they're going to be blessed. Those that are going to follow after his commandments, the nation that's going to follow him will be blessed. And also says in Psalm 146, Happy is he that hath a God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So we even might even be in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation today, but we can also solace ourselves in the fact of knowing that if we as individuals make the Lord our God, 
that even when a, a nation is being judged around us, we can still be pleasing to God. We could still have the blessing of God in our life. You know, we could think about some of the prophets, you know, Jeremiah and Isaiah. And of course, those men suffered, but ultimately they loved God and their outcome ultimately was good. You know, they had to go through some suffering, but even in the midst of this judgment that their nation was going through, God preserved them through that. <clears throat> You're there in Psalm 144. Look at verse 11. It says, rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our shape, sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. You know, this is the prayer that we ought to have. And everyone would want that. No one in, in any nation would say, no, we don't want to prosper. You know, we, don't, we want starvation. We want sickness. We want all these hard things to come. We want to, we want to live in a depressed economy. Nobody wants that. Everyone would read that and say, yeah, that sounds like a good prayer. I would love to have all that. But notice there at the end, it says in verse 15, happy is the people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. So that's kind of the clause that's associated with this blessing. You know, we all, a lot of people like the fruit, but they don't like the tree. They don't want to have to, you know, do the work to get that fruit, you know. Uh, and, and, and there's an if here associated with the blessing of God. If you notice that in verse 1, it said, And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken unto the uh, diligence and the voice of the Lord thy God. Then the blessings come. You know, this is an if. And, and it even continues there in verse 9. It says, The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. So if we don't walk in God's commandments, if we don't keep his ways, then these blessings aren't going to apply to us. You know, and we, we can't just hope for these to come while we're living a wicked and sinful life. And, or, if, you know, a nation cannot expect to have these blessings from God as it's, you know, a, practicing all sorts of abominations, as it's, it's, as it's practicing and promoting wickedness. You know, we can't just sit back and expect God to just turn a blind eye and even people would even assume, to go so far as say, well, God's going to bless us anyway. No, he's not. You know, this is, this is clear in the word of God. Look at verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, uh, above only, and thou shalt not be, be beneath if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God. There it is again. You know, we have to understand that God's blessing is dependent upon whether or not we obey whether as individuals or even as entire nations. He said, which I command this day to deserve, observe and do, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods and serve them. So really what I also want to point out in this chapter is, is we got to notice this principle. You know, there's a blessing and there's the curse. There's the blessing for the obedience and there's the curses for the disobedience. And what that should show us in the word of God is there's no, there's no breaking even with the Lord. There isn't like this middle ground where we're not being blessed, but we're not being cursed. You know, we're just kind of neutral with God. He's just passively, you know, not, you know, uh, uh, you know, acting out on us for our good or for or bad. That doesn't exist. It's either one or the other. We're either living a life that's pleasing to God as individuals or as nations, or we're living lives that are displeasing to God. We're either going to we're either going to enjoy the the pleasures and the benefits of God's blessing upon us as people. Uh, as individuals and families and, or as nations, or we're going to experience the curse of God as individuals and nations. <clears throat> you know, if we fail to keep God's commandments and, and, and we don't hearken unto his ways, you know, uh, we're going to be cursed. But if we do, you know, it, it, we're going to be, it, God is going to bless us. And what this shows us is that God proactively works against those that are disobedient to his word. God doesn't just say, oh, shucks, and turn a blind eye when he sees his children misbehaving, when he sees some wicked nation. He doesn't just, you know, uh, turn a blind eye to that. He proactively reaches out and touches that nation. And he reaches out and touches us as individuals and works in our lives. Why? To make us get right so that we'll quit doing those things that he are displeasing to him and start to walk in newness of life. So what also we can notice here is that because there is, you know, there is no middle ground with God, right? 
But notice that, you know, God is trying to motivate them. Before God gets into all these negative things that are coming, he starts out with the blessing. And, 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 and if the blessings of God, you know, aren't enough to motivate you, you know, maybe the curse of God will. You know, if, if God's uh, blessing in your life isn't enough to make you do right, well, then maybe it's going to take the negative reinforcement to get people to do right. <clears throat> The Bible says uh, in James chapter 4, I'll read to you, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So even we as believers, as Christians, if we start to adopt these worldly philosophies, if we pattern our lives after the world and not after the, after the way God would have us to pattern our lives, we will actually make ourselves the enemy of God. And God is not this, you know, you could have a lot of people as your enemy, right? And maybe even be okay for the, by and large. But if God's your enemy, I mean, that's, 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 some, that's pretty heavy. I mean, I don't know anybody I would rather have, you know, that, that I would want to be my enemy, let alone God. I mean, if anybody you could have is your enemy, why would you want to make God your enemy? But is that not what, I mean, the, James has written to believers. I mean, you go read chapter one and it's brethren, brethren, brethren. You know, these things apply even to us. We can't have this mentality that, oh, we're saved and now God's just going to, you know, ignore all of the sin and all the disobedience in our life. No, God's not going to ignore it. In fact, God is going to work in your life. And we understand that God is gracious and long-suffering and slow to anger. But let's not push the envelope and find out where that line is with God, where it, turns, where it goes beyond just this, chase, this light chasing to where now God is really just going to start coming down hard on us you know, as individuals or even as nations. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's a very true statement. I mean, we love, you know, the statements that Jesus made about how, you know, uh, he has us in his hand and no man is able to pluck him out of his hand. And we love that. But keep in mind also that that's God's hand that you're in. And now that you're in God's hand, I mean, he can do whatever he wants with your life. And if, and if we are going to, you know, live a disobedient life, a sinful life, it shouldn't surprise us when God starts to come down on us. I mean, we read that chapter, I mean, that is a very fearful thing. I mean, there's, there's things in there that if they actually played out in our lives or in our nation, I mean, it would be a horror show. But that's exactly what happens. I mean, we read about that later in the, in the history of Israel. That stuff happened. All those things that it talked about. But... What I want us to notice here also is, uh, is, is, is the ratio of blessings to cursings. You, know, you probably noticed that it kind of started out on that positive note, and then it just seemed like the whole rest of the chapter was just curse, 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 curse. And in fact, you know, the first 14 verses are all blessings, but this is you know, over 60 verses long. <laughs> so the next 29 verses, you know, twice as many curses are then given as, as blessings. You know, the first 14, it's just God's going to bless you if you do this, and this is what's going to go great for you, and this is going to be good in your life. And then he gets to verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 15, and it's just like cursing, 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 cursing for the next 29 verses. <clears throat> and it's, you know, God's curse isn't something that we should just say, well, you know, I'll just deal with it. You know, I can just, you know, if God's upset with me and, and God doesn't like the way I'm doing things, you know, I'll just take it. I don't think we really want that, you know. Uh, as individuals, but especially as a nation, you know, and hopefully everything that's going on right now will start to wake people up in this country to what's going on, because I do believe that what we're experiencing is the judgment of God. Now, when we read this, what we're experiencing pales in comparison, you know, but I do believe it is, you know, it's a warning shot. It's God, you know, very, you know, gently reminding us that things can get much worse than they are. <coughs> And here's the thing, we don't want to get this attitude of, well, whatever God does, you know, if he's displeased with me, I can take it, I'm sure I can handle it. No, you can't. Because when God curses an individual or a nation, I mean, he curses every aspect of these people's lives. There's not an area of their life that we read about that isn't touched by the curse of God. I mean, he messes with everything that's going on with their life, where they can't, they can't make a move without running in to God's wrath. I mean, we'll just go through it real quick here. Look at verse 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body uh, and the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. He's going to mess with your food. 
He's going to mess with your basket and your store, right? We kind of see just a little bit of that right now, right? He's, our baskets got messed with down there, right? We're going down to the Trader Joe's and the Whole Foods and the grocery stores or whatever, you know, and we're, and we're pushing our basket through our store and our favorite food item is gone. And he's kind of messing with Now, is it to this degree? It's nowhere near to this degree. But God, he messes, when he, God decides to come down on a people, he messes with every area of their life. It's not like he's just going to focus in on this one thing and then they could just go about their merry way about everything else. He starts out there in verse 17, messing with the, the food, you know, the kind, the, the flocks of the sheep. Uh, look at verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and, 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 excuse me, and rebuke and all that thou settest thine hand to do. Oh, maybe God's messing with my economy. He's messing with my job, you know, but I'll just go do this instead. Well, God's going to mess with that too. You know, oh, oh, God's, God's messing with the economy, so we're just going to put out a stimulus package. Well, God can mess with that too. And God's going to, God's going to judge every area of a people's life when he wants to. Look at verse 30, and he gets real personal here. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and thou shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt not have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing from them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. I mean, what's left? God's touching everything here. God's messing with every area of these people's lives, their food, their families, their raiment, their houses, everything. When God comes down on a nation or a people, he means business. And we can't get this attitude that, oh, well, you know, maybe this will go wrong, but, you know, we'll still be able to do this or that or the other thing. No, God's going to touch all of it. So that's one thing that's very frightening about the judgment of God upon a nation or upon an individual, that God will be against you at every turn. Not only that, but probably even more frightening than that is the fact that God's curse is inescapable. It's not like you're just going to be able to say, well, you know, God's judging me here, so I'll just pack up and move to another city and run away from my problems. That's not going to work either. God can follow you everywhere you go. Look there in verse 16. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Oh, it's not going too well here in the city. I guess I'll go out in the field. Well, I'm cursed there too. Cur uh, verse 19. Cursed thou shalt be when thou come in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Look there at the latter end of verse 20. Until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly. Verse 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee. You know, this COVID thing is pretty serious. It's not good. A lot of people are dying. You know, it's really contagious. But it, I don't think it's going to be something that cleaves unto us. This pestilence isn't going to be something that just cleaves. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, the, the everyone's right. You know, the, the statisticians and the the people that, you know, study these, these viruses and epidemics and all that that are telling us, hey, we just got to get through this peak, just get over this curve, and then things will start to flatten back out. You know, well, what if, what if God decided to do that? To say, well, no, it's just going to cleave to you. This is the way it is from now on. I mean, can it get to that point? And that's what the Bible's telling us. And it's a strong warning from the Word of God that we see here in Deut Deuteronomy 28 that when God decides to curse... There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nothing that's going to prosper. And if it's up to God, it'll just keep going and going and going. Look at verse, uh, look at there towards the end of ladder, ladder, uh, verse 22, ladder end of tw verse 22. They shall pr pursue thee until thou perish. It's not that you're going to, oh, they're going to run you off. Your enemies are going to run you off and then God's going to pull them back. No, he's just going to let them keep chasing you until he gets every single one of you. And he goes on in verse 23. And the heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Look at verse, uh, latter end, verse, uh, we'll start in verse 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust from heaven, shall it come up un, uh, upon thee until thou be destroyed. I mean, he's saying, look, I'm just going to keep judging you and judging you and judging you and judging you until, there's, until you're just destroyed. <clears throat> Look down there at verse 44, verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and pursue thee 
and take and overtake thee till thou be destroyed. When God decide, put, gets it in his mind and he decides, well, I'm just going to judge these people severely. Nobody's going to stop him. I don't care how many stimulus packages they roll out. I don't care how many you know, National Guard units they call up, how much they, mil they mobilize the military. When God has had enough with a nation, he'll judge it, and that's it. And what we should take away from this is that we as individuals, you know, even in the midst of that nation, you know, we don't want to have a part in this. I mean, obviously we're all going to have to suffer to some degree if this happened. But we, we can at least have the, the peace of knowing that if we're right with God, that God will, in wrath, remember mercy on his people. But, you know, this is some, you know, real negative preaching. This is a real strong warning out of the word of God. But the fact that it starts out with God's blessing, with God saying, look, I'll bless you if you do this, and I'll bless you here, and I'll bless you there, and then goes into all these curses, it tells me that God's preference is, to have, you know, is positive reinforcement. I think God would prefer to bless people. I think that's God's desire. God wants to look down on a nation or an individual and see them following after his commandments and living for him and, and doing what's right and him being able to just open up the storehouses of heaven, open up the windows of heaven and just pour out a blessing upon them. And that's what we read about. I mean, God was going to make them very prosperous. God was willing to make them just, just, over, just abound with blessings to be the head and not the tail so that where every nation would look at them and just be in awe and just be in wonder and that they would be a light unto the Gentiles. That's what God's desire is. God would rather use positive reinforcement than the negative. And the proof of that is that it starts out that way. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, I'll read to you from verse 3, it says, And thinkest thou this, O man, or that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? How do people end up in a position where they are cursed in such a way? Is it because God's just some you know, uh, maniacal, you know, vindictive uh, God would just, just hell-bent on punishing people? No. He, God is, uh, the Bible says he, he, they despise the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and his long-suffering. God is all those good things. But it's man that despises that. The man, and for whatever reason, decides that he's going to despise God in spite of the fact that God is willing to bless them more than they could ever imagine. And God, in turn, just has to say, okay, well, if you don't want my blessing and you want to reproach me for who I am and for what my word says, well, then you can have the curse instead. You can go ahead and have the cursing. The Bible says there, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to, re to repentance. You know, a lot of times I think in our lives, yeah, we know the chastening hand of God is there, but you know, and I think a lot of times God does show us grace. I think, you know, if we mess up here and there, maybe we go through a season or something, I don't think that just immediately means God's just going to smack us down. I think a lot of times God deals with his children by showing them the good side. Hey, I know you messed up. I know you're not right. But I still love you. And if you'll get this right, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, the goodness of God is what brings people back often. But again, there is that line that God has where we don't, we, we, none of us wants to find out where it is whether in our lives or in a nation. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, it should be the love of God towards us that should compel us to be obedient. You know, uh, the blessings aside, I mean, read about the blessings, we say, well, I want that for my life. That should be our attitude. But, is, you know, beyond even that, just the fact that Christ died for us, the love that God has toward us, that the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. That alone should be enough to make us want to, to, to do right. Not just avoiding the cursing, not just to have the blessing, but just the understanding that God loves us and God is good towards us. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A very familiar verse that we use out soul winning all the time. But what's interesting about that is that word commendeth. God commendeth his love. That's kind of like that word recommend. You know, if I were to ask you to play like a restaurant, hey, can you recommend a good place to get, you know, a burger or something? You would say, hey, go to this place. It's better than the rest, right? That's what you're doing when you recommend something. You're saying, in my opinion, this place is better than any other place. And that's what God is saying about his love. God is saying that his love toward us is better 
than anybody else's love. And that's truth. There is no other human relationship that you can have on this earth that can compare towards the love that God has toward you, uh, towards you. The love that you have towards your children, the love that your children have towards you, your spouses, friends, whatever. The love that you can have out of those relationships, they pale in comparison with the love that God has towards us. And God, you know, it, that alone should be enough to bring people to a place of obedience, to where they want to please God, where they want to live for God. But is that the case? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately, in spite of that fact, there are people out there that despise the forbearance and the long-suffering of God, and they do respite to the spirit of grace. So then God has to turn around and reach into his bag of tricks and say, okay, well, if you don't want the love and you don't want the blessing, you can have the chastening instead. If you think I'm this and you think I'm that, I'll just go ahead and be that for you. If you think I'm just this wick, just mean, wicked, evil, vindictive God, I can play that part for you. If, if the love that he has towards us isn't good enough. Now, that does, make, that, does that make God all those things? Of course not. You know, these people, they deserved everything that they got. Because unto whom much is given shall much also be required. They knew their Lord's will and did it not and were beaten with many stripes. They had, they had the law. They had the oracles of God. They had the testimonies of God. They had Moses. They saw the fire come down on the mount. I mean, think about all the things that you read in the beginning of Deuteronomy. All the things that just made them accountable to God. I mean, to see the God split in the Red Sea and lead them out, out of the, after the plagues of Egypt and then the fire coming down from heaven and, and, and knowing all these things, wandering in the wilderness, seeing all the many things that they saw, the, the battles that were won, the earth opening up and swallowing false prophets, and so on and so forth. They had all these testimonies. They had God's word. So when they decided, well, that's not for us anymore, God, that's when God came down on them, and God went ahead and punished them. <laughs> so God, you know, he, he will punish and God punishes harshly, you know, because of the fact that, you know, disobeying God, it's not just this I, refusing to obey. You know, it, when we disobey God, as again, and I'm going to keep saying it over and over again, and as a person or as, a, as an individual or as a nation, when we decide that we're going to refuse to obey God, it's not just, it's not just simple disobedience. It's actually despising the goodness of God. It's us turning up our nose and saying, I don't need your blessing. I'm, you know, no thanks. That sounds nice, but I don't need it. That's, it it's, it's a despising of God. <clears throat> and that's why God, I believe, comes down so harshly. It's because God's more than willing to just bless you beyond measure. And when we turn up our nose or, or just say, you know, you know, say, oh, talk to the hand, God. Not interested. You know, God's offended. You know, God, God is... is uh, upset about that. And he's not one who's just going to, you know, you know uh, lick his wounds and, and, and have hurt feelings over it. He's going to retaliate. He's going to say, no, you're still going to do what I want. And if you don't want the blessing, you can do it because I won't, you know, you, know, you can do it out of the fear of being cursed. God's going to get what he wants out of people. So, you know, that's why I believe God is coming down so harshly there. If you look there in verse 46, now going, there's a lot to go through in this chapter. And it's a very long chapter. It's hard to, you know, cover every single thing, but I believe there's just this general overarching principle in this chapter that we see of, you know, we can come down on one of two sides with God, the blessing or the curse. You know, we could go in through each one of these curses and talk about them, but I think the, the more important thing to, look, to learn tonight is the fact that God isn't this one-dimensional figure, that God is, is uh, you know, isn't just static, that he's fluid, that God interacts with us as individuals and as nations. So look at verse 46, and it says there, And they shall be upon thee for a sign and a wonder, and upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Saying, look, I'm going to bring all these cursings upon you, and they're going to be a sign and a wonder upon thy seed forever. People are going to, we look, we, isn't that not the truth? Do we not look back on the children of Israel and still read about the curses that are upon them forever? And they're a sign to us, and they're a wonder to us. I mean, God's word, he fulfilled that. We look back and we shake our heads and we go, how could they do that? How could they, you know, worship, you know, Moloch? And, 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 and how could they, uh, you know, sacrifice uh, their, their children? And how could they worship idols of stone and, and silver and wood? And 
How could they cast off, you know, how could they worship the queen? And they had everything. And that's, and God, and God's saying, look, that will be assigned to everybody else that comes after you. You'll be a wagging of the head. You're going to be a byword to all people because, in verse 7, thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness. You know, sometimes I think we get this idea in our heads that serving God is just this drudgery. It's like something that just has to be endured. I guess I got to live for God now. I got to serve God and live for God or he's going to rain up and cloud on me. I don't want God to just beat me down. I guess I'll go to church and read my Bible and pray and, you know, live a good life and, and try to just do the right thing if I have to. Is that what God wants? Is that, is that what the Christian life is to us? It shouldn't be. I mean, it should be a joyful thing to live for God. It should be a joyful thing. We should be able to rejoice in reading the Bible, rejoice in, in knowing that we can pray and be heard by the very God of heaven. We can rejoice in the fellowship that we have in Christ, rejoice in, in getting together for preaching and, and, and going out and serving the Lord. These are things that we do with joy. You know, the, the Christian life is not just this, this burden to be endured. You know, and some people, you know, they cast it in this light. I've even heard preachers in the past that just try to make living for God in this world like it's some kind of just gauntlet that has to be run through. I'm not saying the Christian life is just, you know, you know, a bed of roses until we get to heaven. That, it, you know, life in and of itself has its trials and tribulations, but we can still go through it with joyfulness. You know, we can rejoice in all things in Christ. We can do it with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. And that's what he's saying here. Look, I'm going to go ahead and curse you because you didn't want to serve me in light of the fact that I was going to give you an abundance of all things. You despise the riches of my grace. You know, it reminds me, of, you know, I was trying to think of an illustration and it reminds me of, and this is not something that, uh, this is not a personal illustration, so don't get the wrong impression. But, it, you know, I've heard this elsewhere, so I'm reusing it. It reminds me of, of the, the husband, you know, his wife calls him and says, hey, I just made this, this delicious, nutritious meal that is going to, you're going to eat it, you're going you're gonna to be healthier for it, and it tastes great. Come on home and have dinner. And he says, okay, and on the way he stops at Burger King. And then he gets there and just, I'm not hungry. You know, he's just burping up a Whopper. And he's turning down this T-bone and asparagus and mashed potatoes with the skins in it, right? And, and all that good stuff. That's kind of like when we disobey God. And when we say, you know what? I'd rather not have the blessings of God. I'm just going to have my sin. I mean, imagine how that wife feels. She went to all that trouble. She made that delicious meal. And then the husband just comes home and, eh. I'm full already. Really? Why? Well, I stopped at Burger King and I ate trash. You know, I had just this, this terrible, that doesn't, it doesn't even come close in nutritional value and it probably doesn't even taste as good. In fact, it doesn't. I know because <laughs> I don't want to go off on it. I had, I had gone years without a Whopper when we moved out here. I hadn't had Burger King. And then after years, I was just like, honey, go get me a Whopper. And she went and got me a Whopper. I couldn't even finish it. It was, it was so bad, right? But that kind of, that's kind of the illustration that we can use with God. God, you know, he wants to just give us this blessing. God just wants to furnish us with all these great things, just pour out this blessing and give us just an abundance of all things. But we think, nah, you know, we're just going to have our, you know, our pittance over here with our sin. We don't want to live for you. We don't want your blessing. <clears throat> God's offended every bit as that wife would be. You know, the only difference is, is God is going to, you know, there's going to be some wrath. I mean, I guess the wife could do that too. Maybe she'll start hiding your socks on your socks. I don't know. You know, they've got their tricks too. <clears throat> but, you know, if we just continue to reject God's goodness by disobeying, don't, you know, God's not just going to go sulk in the corner. Well, they don't like me. You know, I want to do all these nice things, but they don't want anything to do with me. God's not just going to go have hurt feelings and feel bad about it. God gets proactive and says, oh, okay, you want to play that game? You know, if a nation wants to just reject me and cast me off, you know, much like this nation, a nation that, you know, by and large was a, you know, quote unquote Christian nation in its founding, whether they were all safe people or not, they at least had biblical principles that guided their lives throughout in every area of society where God was, you know, God obviously just blessing this country. And then to become what we've become now, 
who are just, you know, supporting and promoting the worst filth that there is and just, you know, taking God out of every aspect of public life and that the world by and large, this nation by and large is not a Christian nation. I don't care how many coins or money you want to stamp with the, the name God on it. That doesn't make you a Christian nation. What makes you a nation that's blessed by God is when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow this book and obey it. And when we've gone from what we were to what we are, God's not just going to go sulk in the corner about it. God, you know, just like with Israel. He's not just going to go, well, I guess, I guess they don't want me. I guess I'll go find somebody else. God's going to deal with that nation. God's going to judge that nation <clears throat> to try to bring them back. <clears throat> you know, we don't want God actively fighting against us. And we don't have to. You know, that's, that's the great thing about this chapter. It's, it's the if, right? If you obey, the blessing. But if you don't, then the cursing. The choice is, our, is ours to make as a nation or as a people. <clears throat> and, you know, not being cursed by God, that should be blessing enough right there. I mean, just if God just does, holds back his punishment. I mean, think about how much this nation is worthy to be judged so much more harshly than it is. It's worthy. I mean, all the innocent blood through the warfare and the abortions, all the filth and the smut and everything that's just being propagated by this country, and we get this little virus that comes through. I mean, that's not even a tenth of what this nation deserves. It's nothing. You know, people are all upset because they have to go to the grocery store and wait in line. Well, I don't know if you notice in this, in this here, I mean, this is, reads like a nightmare where people are eating their children. I mean, it, we aren't even close to what these people experienced. And quite frankly, you know, I wonder if this nation doesn't deserve that. This, this, this severe judgment for everything that it's done. So the fact that God isn't just right now just completely coming down on this country, you know, and, and people are complaining about all these little inconveniences and about money, you know, it could be so much worse. And you know what? God would be perfectly just in making it a thousand times worse than it is right now. So that alone is blessing in and of itself, the fact that God is still holding back. You, know, you want to see the silver lining through the, the COVID crisis? How about that that's all there is going on right now? How about that we're not being invaded by foreign enemies and being besieged and having to hold up and the food stores are completely run out and we're all just covered head to toe in, in, in scabs and itches and emeralds and everything else? <clears throat> that's blessing in enough right, in the, right there. <clears throat> so... Really, that's, you know, this current pandemic is just a cakewalk compared to what God could do and, in fact, what God has done. As we read there, look there in verse 48. He said, Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies which the Lord thy God sent against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. Not just, you know, my favorite loaf of bread, you know, or my preferred food product. You know, that's, that's our great tribulation right now, going to the grocery store, you know, and having to see these goofballs with all these crazy <laughs> get-ups, right? That's actually kind of amusing. <laughs> you know, or we, but we get there and our favorite thing isn't on the shelf, and that's, that's, what, that's the big punishment right now. Are we in want of all things? No. <clears throat> He said in verse 49, The Lord shall bring, against thee, uh, bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed. He also shall leave thee no, uh, neither uh, either corn, wine, or oil, or the in, uh, increase of thy kind, or the flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all the gates until the high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in the gates throughout all thy land with which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherein thine enemies shall distress thee. I mean, that's, 
I can't imagine a more horrific thing. I mean, every parent probably runs through that scenario in their head where one of their kids is abducted or taken away or something like that, or some horrific thing happens to them. But, I mean, this is, this is some serious business here. You know, and is this, is this God just talking big? Is this God just, you know, puffing up his chest? No, this is what God does. God did this to these people. And, you know, that, this should be a very strong warning to this country and all nations that forget God, that want to cast off the Lord, that want to just close the book and never look at it again and just say, that's not for me. Well, there might be some things in there that you, you should probably concern yourself about, some things you might want to, to know about, about who God is and how he does things. Because this is, some, this is an aspect of God you're probably not going to, you know, this is not what you read about in Sunday school. But it's in the book, folks. This is what God does when he judges nations. It's, he rolls up his sleeves and he gets to work and he brings people to their knees. So, you know, why don't we just get there? Why, 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 what's the sense of, of going through all this ourselves? You know, or, or just generally speaking, why do we want to go ahead and just see what the judgment of God is like in our own personal life? Let me just find out what God's going to do when he chastens me. Let me just continue to be disobedient and, and to not care about the things of God. And let's just see what God's chastening hand is going to be like in my life. Do we really want to find that out? Because as we just read, it can get pretty severe with God. When God sees fit and he wants to just go ahead and, and lay it on heavy, that's what he does. <clears throat> he says in verse 54, So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward his, the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave. So he will not give any to the, of them of the flesh of his children whom he, he shall eat. I mean, God's talking about just straight up cannibalism here. This is what he's going to bring upon these people. And, we, and, and you say, well, that's crazy. But that's exactly what they did. And, you say, and then when it happens, people want to shake their fists and say, how could God let that happen? The question is, how did you let that happen? The question is, how did they let this happen to themselves? It's not like God warned them you know, years in advance hundreds of years in advance. It's not like they had the written word of God with them that they could read this and know about it. Oh, wait, yeah, they did. And then, you know, th that should be a warning to us. I mean, we read about the things that are coming in Revelation. We read about the judgments, the chastisements that God will bring upon nations, and we even read about the things that God will do in our own personal lives. And then we want to just wonder when things go bad or, or then we're caught off guard when God actually goes ahead and, and judges us and get mad at him and say, how dare he? It's not like God didn't give these people fair warning. He told them exactly what would happen if they disobeyed, but they went ahead and did it anyway. <clears throat> he says in verse 55, so that he will not give to any of them the flesh of his own children who shall eat because he hath nothing left in the siege and the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you which would not adventure to set the full sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. Her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward the children she shall bear for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and the strait wherewith thine enemies shall distress thy, thee and thy gates. I mean, God can, has the ability to just make a nation's life and the people in it make their lives just a literal living nightmare. I mean, this is horrific, but this is what God says will happen to people, to them specifically, is that, and, and the, you know, that, that these type of things happen. And, and, you know, what we could take from it is that God chastens. You know, God, God's just not up in heaven just feeling bad for himself when we decide to disobey. You know, God starts to do things in our lives. Now, is it going to come to this in our personal lives? No. I mean, I mean that would be pretty severe, wouldn't it? But, do, I mean, what we can learn from it is that, is that God judges his people and that, that judgment begins in the house of God, that God does chasten his children to some degree or another. And, you know, when God starts to do that in your life, the last thing you want to do is stiffen your neck. The Bible says, Him, He that being often reproof hardens his neck shall be suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. 
I mean, that's what we read about here in this chapter, I mean, those, those verses where he's saying, look, I'm going to give you the botch and the itch and this and that, of which thou canst not be healed. It's not like God's just going to give you or chasing you and, then, and you can just go make it all better on your own. He's saying, look, he, he was going to go ahead and, and smite them with these things and there was no cure. It's permanent. We don't want to get there in our lives where we make such a mess out of our own life that the consequences are permanent. I mean, even if we do eventually get right and get the sin out or whatever it is and get right with Lord, you know, there's still things that are, those consequences can still follow us for the rest of our life. <clears throat> I mean, God can just make our lives a literal living nightmare where there's just, just nowhere to run. You know, and we as a nation, we're nowhere near this. I mean, we're not doing these things. You know, today we're, we're eating, you know, Chick-fil-A is still open, Chipotle is still open, you know, all the, you know, everyone, people are just, you know, smacking each other over toilet paper, you know, and everyone's losing their minds. <clears throat> we're nowhere near that. But, we, and we, you know, we don't want, but we don't want to find out what that's like. I mean, we read about these things, and what did he say in verse 34? He said, you're going to see these things, and what did he say in verse 34? So that thou shalt be mad. For the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. You know, people did witness this. You know, King Hezekiah, he had that, the woman that they were in an argument. Hey, we ate her kid the other day. Now it's time to eat her kid. And she's hit him. And he rent his clothes and put sackcloth and ashes on. He didn't come down off the wall and say, oh, let me sort that out for you. Where's that kid at? I mean, it drove him mad. It just these things, if we actually witnessed this type of thing or lived when this type of thing went down, it would just drive people insane. And that's what God is saying, that that's what will happen. That if these things play out, it would, just, it would just be, I mean, we can't even imagine what it would be like. <laughs> and what we're seeing right now, that this, this COVID, this coronavirus crisis, you know, is nowhere near this. But does that mean it's not the judgment of God? No, I believe it is the judgment of God. But I believe it's just, it's this. It's God just reaching down and going, stop it. It's not God taking off the belt, you know, and, and, and bending the, this country over his knee and laying into him. It's God smacking their hand. And the, quite frankly, this nation, you know, in my opinion, deserves a lot more than what we're getting because of everything that we've done. You know, this, I don't even know you could liken this unto a hand slap. This is more like God just giving the child a very stern look. You know, I had that with my dad. I'd do something, he'd just give me that look. And be like, oh, that's, that's, where, that's where I feel we're at with this whole thing. I mean, yeah, it's going to have severe consequences, but is it anywhere near as severe what we just read tonight? Nowhere near it. <clears throat> and, and here's the thing. You know, if we can't handle this, what we're going through right now, you know, we don't stand a chance in the tribulation. We won't stand a chance when God really, if, if we're wigging out, and biting our nails and pulling our hair and just fretting and anxious over this, when God really finally does decide to, to really let this nation have it, I don't, I don't know how we're going to handle it if that's us. I mean, it might just drive us mad. He said in Jeremiah, If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, how then will thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Look, if we're all worried about bottled water and toilet paper, and that's our big issue in this country, and we're all, people are losing their minds, what's going to happen when God really starts to judge, when it's not just a little smack on the wrist, when God really starts to lay in? <clears throat> you know, and this probably isn't the most encouraging sermon to preach at this time, but this is where I fell tonight. I'm going chapter by chapter through this book, and that's how it all played out. You know, uh, so that's where we're at. So, but what can we take from this? Is that God's judgment doesn't come without a cause, and that's good news. That's good news. Is because God, you know, what that tells us is that God isn't just up there. He's not some kid with a magnifying glass burning ants, if you know what I mean. He's not macabre. He's not just, you know, torturing these people for no reason. He's not judging them just because, you know, it's, it's his thing. You know, the curse causeless shall not come. 
And that's a good thing, you know. And now we can't control everything our nation does, obviously, but we as individuals, you know, we can be on the right side of God. That's what this chapter is about, I believe, is the blessing and the curse. Which one do you want? And that's the good news, is that we have that choice in our life. Despite whatever is going on around us, we as individuals can be on the right side of the Lord. Or even if everything else is going wrong in the world, God could still say, well, I'm going to take care of you. I mean, we think about Elijah. You know, when, when the, everyone else is worshiping Baal and, and Jezebel is out to take his head off, God took him and hit him and gave him, you know, fed him with the ravens, the meat from the ravens. He still took care of the people that were faithful and loved him. So that's the good news. <clears throat> so as a nation or as individuals, you know, we have to decide which side of God we want to be on in our life. And we have to understand, first of all, in order to make that decision, we have to get it, we have to understand, really, this is what I want to drive home tonight, is that there's no middle ground with God. It's not just this gray area where you don't fall into one of these categories. You're either going to be on God's good side and experience the blessing, or you're going to experience God's curse. You know, there's no spiritual Switzerland with God. You know, I'm just, I'm going to stay out of the fight. No, you're either on his side or against him. You know, if we're not for him, you know, if Jesus said, if they be not for us, they're against us. So we want to make sure we're on God's side. You know, that, and that's good news. That we can still have the blessing. This is a very negative chapter, of course. But remember how God opens it up. Reminding them of the goodness and, and the blessings of God that he is willing and able to pour out a blessing and, and, to, and, to, and, and to make us just thrive. And, and, you know, maybe not economically, maybe not all the ways we, we would like, but God can take care of us, you know, and God you know, will give us food and raiment, and, there, and we shouldn't worry. You know, God takes care of the fowl of the air. How much more are, are you uh, worth uh, than many sparrows? You know, no matter how bad things get, if we're right with God, we have nothing to worry about. You know, and that's something this nation needs to learn, ultimately. And that's really who I think that needs this warning more than anybody is this nation as a whole, is that there's no middle ground with God. God's not impressed with, you know, your, your, your presidential day of prayer or, you know, whatever, you know, religious ceremony they want to go through. You know, they need to learn, as it says in Psalm, to kiss the sun lest he be angry. They ought to grab this book and embrace it lest God get angry. And they should learn that this is what ought to guide the affairs of man on earth. And their decision should be, should be based on this. And because if it's not, well then, they're, now they're opposed to it. And now God's their enemy. But that's the nation. We don't have to have that. We can have God, you know, uh, as our friend and blessing us no matter what this nation does. So let's do that. You know, let's be, uh, you know, let's, let's shine as lights in a crooked and perverse nation, as the Bible says. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for the entire word of God. Thank you for every line. Thank you for every chapter. Thank you for showing us the good, bad, and the ugly. Lord, it's, it's, it's the things that we need to know. It's the things that aren't being taught in so many pulpits across this country. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to read our Bibles and help us to know these things for ourselves. And Lord, help us to understand that no matter what happens, as long as we're right with you, as long as we're doing those things as individuals, that please you, we'll know that all things will work together to them that love God, to them that are called according to your purpose. Lord, I pray you just keep us safe and help us, Lord, to continue to look to you in these times. In Christ's name we pray, amen.